If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 115. I am, um, by all those who know me, I'm known as the person who cannot, cannot make it to the place they're supposed to go. I get lost everywhere. I get lost. I live south of Memphis. I get lost in Memphis. I pick people up from the airport who will preach at the church where I pastor. I get lost. <clears throat> Until I had a smartphone, there was a man that lived in West Memphis, across the river, that I would just call every time I was lost. And uh, he owns a Christian bookshop there, dear friend. And I would say to him, okay, this is what I'm looking at. There's a big building. It says this on top. Where am I? He'd say, oh, where do you want to be? I'd say, well, I want to be here. And he'd say, well, okay, two lights down, take a left, and thanks. And so now I have a smartphone. <clears throat> I still get lost. I was in Boston on, a, on an, uh, an anniversary with my wife, and we got away. So I went to Boston in the fall. It had a heat wave. It was terrible. But anyway, in Boston, I had my smartphone, and uh, the tall buildings interrupted the signal, and I walked in circles until I walked by the same beggar so many times. My wife said, do you want me to ask which way to go? And I said, absolutely not. I got this. And so now, sometimes people pity me, and when... When I'm supposed to go somewhere, they say, look, just follow me, all right? And I say, okay, don't lose me. And they go through these cities, and they, it's their city, and they lose me. We're going to be jumping around. Normally, I'd preach through one book and, and just go verse by verse. And um, having given my apology, we're going to be jumping around at a number of verses, looking at three men in the Scripture today who can help us particularly from their lives. And while we do that, I need to preface that with some, a personal statement about why in the world I think that beginning with God, when we begin our ecclesiology, is a topic that we might need to talk about together. And so after some introductory statements that are personal, then I want us to agree on some big biblical realities and then we're ready to look at the three passages, all right? It won't take as long as it did to explain it. But I do want us to read this wonderful description contrasting our God and every other imagination. Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They, eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord's. Well, Let's seek the Lord one more time together before we look at these things. Our gracious God, before your face, you know us, everything about us. We live and have our being before you. You are the God before whom we stand. You are the incom incomprehensible and incomparable God. You are everlasting and unapproachably pure. And yet you have stooped down to seek Adam's fallen race. You have sought out a bride for your son. You have set your affections upon a people. You have determined in eternity past to send mercy alongside justice. 
And God, no one here would dare to approach such a throne in prayer. Except that it is occupied by our kinsman redeemer. And so we plead because of what Christ has accomplished. That in keeping with your promises to him. That you would give him, Lord, people from every tongue and tribe and nation. Father, we look at our own lives. We want him to have every area. We pray that where you find us now, you would not leave us. Here, but for the great glory of Jesus Christ, you would deal with us in such a way that the things that we read in an ancient book would come home to us and we would make room in the soil of our hearts and in our lives so that the cares of life don't pluck away things we've been learning at the conference. Lord, we ask these things of you for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever Ages without end. In Christ's name, amen. In 1996, I graduated from uh, Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary, and my family and I, to the great surprise of everyone that was related to us, especially grandparents, my wife and my two children under the age of two packed up, and we went to the little country of Wales, which if you'll just find a map of the solar system, Wales is at the center of all things. <laughs> England is east of it. I had been a pastor for three years in South Mississippi. I had been reading Puritans. I had been reading Spurgeon. I had a godly grandfather that introduced me to Spurgeon long before I ever met the Lord. At age 12, I was reading those little books, you know, Spurgeon on prayer, Spurgeon on this, 12 sermons on holiness. And Really, just to be precocious, I would sit beside my father, who also was a believer, and uh, while he read his theology books, I'd read my theology book. I read Tozer. I read about Hudson Taylor. When I pastored a church, I read all the good books I could find, but I was very discouraged with church. The people hated the gospel that I was teaching. They hated the doctrines of grace, and I don't put all the blame on them. Really, I was ill-equipped to pastor. I didn't know how to take the things that I found to be life-giving and bring them to bear upon a soul in a way that was in cooperation with the work of the Holy Spirit. How does God save? How does that mean I'm supposed to act as a pastor? I had a long list of don'ts. Don't lead people through this quick sinner's prayer. Don't do this. Don't do this. But I really didn't have an ecclesiological model for how to do it. In other words, I hadn't been in a very healthy church that gave me anything better than what I already had. So I had a long list of don'ts and I was bothered. I left that church to finish my master's degree work and every morning I woke up, I rode to school with uh, some, one of my friends that's here. I rode an hour to seminary every morning, hour back. I was sleeping about four hours a night. It was the worst year for me spiritually. My wife and I at each other's throats, my quiet time's non-existent, and I would say, no matter what happens today, at least I'm not a pastor. I was so happy not to be pastoring. I thought church was where people who didn't really want to accomplish anything in the ministry went. I'm not kidding. I thought that being a professor, now, now you could be a professor, you could train men. Why I thought men that don't like church would be a good person to train other men, I don't know, but I thought I could be a professor. Then I thought I could be a missionary. I could be an itinerant. I went to the little country of Wales, so spiritually discouraged with church, so spiritually dry myself. And I studied a wonderful topic, the influence of the 17th century Puritan writers on the 18th century Great Awakening men. So this would be George Whitfield, particularly in Wales and England, the Calvinistic wing of the revival. It's great stuff. Also in my heart, I determined that it wasn't right to go to all the way over to Wales to study revival and my own heart be so cold toward Christ. I dare not study revival and come back academically different, but spiritually as cold as I was when I left. So I determined that no matter what happened, I would meet with the Lord before I met with anybody else. And so each morning, doing what every Christian knows to do, I'd wake up and I'd open the scriptures and I began in the Gospel of Luke and in John later, and I spent three years just in those two books. 
It was for me a wonderful time to rethink everything. Now, I told you I already was reading the good books. I already had five points in my head. I already had a list of don'ts. But I hadn't seen this applied in a, in a healthy way. So the church I attended, now do not go to the UK to find a good church. There are many good churches in the UK, but you don't generally as Americans think that we'll leave the Mid-South and go over to the UK where less than 1% or 2% attend any religion, any religious gathering anywhere. But I, through the Lord's providence, was sent there, and there was a church called the Heath Evangelical Church where the pastor was such a, a godly, helpful pattern. He was the best friend of Martin Lloyd-Jones. You keep hearing about Martin Lloyd-Jones. I got to meet the people that were converted under his preaching. It was wonderful. I would ask him all the Lloyd-Jones questions I could ask. While I was there for three years, I didn't have to pastor, so it was an oasis for me. I could just think. And it really restored for me, or gave me for the first time, um, a biblical appreciation of what a church could be. And what a pastor it could be. So I returned in 1999 and became a part of a church plant in North Mississippi. Been there for the last 14 years. Now I feared my propensity, which is I love the Puritans and I love the 18th century, but I didn't like the 21st century. So I knew that I could slip into the habit of preaching a sermon and then running back into my library and comforting myself with old friends that have been dead for 200 years. So when I got back to the States, I, I asked around, so, you know, who's doing good thinking about church? I'm about to plant a church. And I heard, this, I heard all these glowing reports about new young reformed guys. Now, I'm not talking about Albert Moeller and Southern because I had been here for that. But I, I'm talking about the new young and restless group. And so I, I'd been in Wales. I hadn't stuck my head out, so I was so excited, I went and bought a book of their most popular man, and I read on how to be a reformational pastor, and I was so grieved. The sexual crassness and the shocking language, which was taken for granted that you can't minister to anybody under the age of 70 and doesn't live in Nashville unless you approach them that way, that was not the major problem for me. It was that I was being introduced by a pastor who was supposed to be a model for rethinking church. I was being introduced to a smug and arrogant and foul, in-your-face, strutting Jesus Christ that I had never met in Scripture, and certainly not in those years in the Gospel of John. I wish I had this conference when I came back, but I didn't. And I wanted to hide in the 17th century after I read the 21st century, And I couldn't. My wife made me put that book on the top shelf so my kids couldn't find it. Imagine putting Paul's book of Galatians on the top shelf so your kids don't find it. Now, am I alone? I mean, aren't there a lot of guys like me who they read Spurgeon. Then Spurgeon mentions Whitfield. I don't know who Whitfield is, so I went and go read Whitfield. Then Whitfield mentions Puritans. I thought they all wore the same color clothing and lived in America and had Thanksgiving. (laughs) So I read the Puritans. John Flavel, John Owen, John Bunyan, Richard Baxter, Richard Sibbs. But how do you do it in a way that is honest with the Scripture? Because we're not allowed to be 17th century or 18th century. That would be simple. As a pastor of a Reformed church, who cares about what's going on in the reform movement, I find that it is hard to become encouraged when I hear that another reformed church has been planted by a young person or another church has been, which has been established is now, the pulpit is now occupied by a young reformed guy because I used to get so excited until I watched what they did. And I know they believed in election, but that's all I could find. And so now these wonderful truths were being applied in a way that was in such disharmony with Christ in their ecclesiology that I really would have rather they didn't know those things. The reform movement is clearly as confused about ecclesiology today as any 
other movement in American evangelicalism. And the cure is not the new edgy book, but I guess you already agree with that. You wouldn't be here. But I want to say also the cure is not going back and getting a great old Puritan book. And I don't even think that the first step in the cure is the pastoral epistles. All right, you can throw things at me later. Let me explain. The scripture tells us how, everything we need to understand to apply the gospel in our cultural context. You have all these tools. You have the scripture, of course, infallible. You also have other tools that draw from the scripture. You have the old writers. You have nine marks. You have ten indictments to, to uh, avoid. And, but folks, I find that we reach out with this withered, anemic arm. And we go to pick up John Owen and we can't do it. And we go to pick up someone else and we can't do it. We can't even pick up nine marks. We go to the pastoral epistles and our heads inform. But when you go to apply it, we find ourselves too weak. I do believe there is a place that we have to start before we can begin to use those. And because I think that for us, not for every generation, but for our generation, we have been so emaciated for so long that the the shift has to go deeper than ecclesiology. It has to go deeper than soteriology. Though those are both essential, it has to go all the way to theology. That is this. You can add five points to your old view of God, and you will not be what you hope to be. You will not bring honor to the Lord. You can add good ecclesiology, but if you haven't dealt with this shriveled, inadequate view of God that you've carried over, then you really won't do what you hope to do. You cannot arrive at the destination of being a God-centered church and a God-centered individual if you approach it from any other origin except the one that the Scripture would have you to approach it from, and that is you're going to have to begin by rethinking God. Now, I know that in other days it wouldn't have been as essential, but now it is. A new foundation has to be put into place that can support the weight of a lasting work of grace through the church. Now, that leads us to some big picture truths that I want us to agree on before we look at these passages. And I find it helpful to back up from me, to back up from the church I pastor, to back up from the American mess that we're seeing, to back up from everything and to, to look at him, to see big truths, and then to zero back in. So we're going to look at these big truths and then the three men. So let me give these kind of universal truths. Number one, God clearly in Scripture explains that He is doing everything that He is doing and has done and will do. He is doing it for His namesake, for His glory. Now, because of recent preaching in the last decade or two, we don't have to argue about that, and that's a real benefit. Conrad preached yesterday about God and worship. He is doing everything, everything. He is doing it in a, in a way that it unveils the solitary, incomprehensible splendor that belongs to him. The weight of his majesty is being reflected in his, not just in his biblical descriptions, not just in the great doctrine, not just in the songs and the prayers and the prophecies, but in the activities of God. So in Revelation 4, we find heaven gathered around the Father on the throne, and they say that He is worthy to receive glory. He has expressed His character beautifully in creation. In chapter 5, it's in redemption. The Son is worthy to receive glory. He has unveiled the Father to us in redemption. But we could say that about everything that God does. The pattern of Christ on earth is the same. John 17, verse 4, I have glorified you on earth. I have manifested you. How? I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Hebrews 1 verse 3, Christ is the radiance of his glory, the outshining of the Father's reality, the unveiling of God, because he is the exact representation of his nature. That is, everything you see Christ doing is in such perfect harmony with the Father that when you see him, Christ can say, even in his humanity, if you've seen me, if you've watched me live, you've seen the Father. Our task is akin to that, though we are mirrors that are like mirrors in an old antique shop. You ever go antiquing and you see a really pretty piece, but it's got a mirror on it and it's all wavy and warped through heat and years. 
The Christian is not a perfect mirror. We'll never be able to say it to anyone, if you've seen me, you've seen God. But Christ in John 17, in verse 18, again in verse 22, he, he talks about the connection. In the same way that I was sent, I'm sending you. Not to be a redeemer of the world, but to walk with me on my, as relate to me on my throne as I've related to my Father. In a dependence and a yieldedness. And then in a few verses later, Father, I give them the glory you gave me. Not the uncreated splendor of Christ, which he prays in verse 5, will one day be returned to him at the end of his redemptive work. But it's the, glory, it's the opportunity to reflect the reality of God. So, my glory I give to them. My pattern I give to them. Why? So that Ephesians 3 verse 21 is more than a sermonic text. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. That's the first big truth, all right? I think we're agreed on that. God is doing all that he ever has done for his glory to unveil himself. Second, if that's to to be true, real, then we have to understand that everything God does reflects his character. There is no contradiction in our God. He is single, not fragmented. We can discuss the different aspects of his character, but it's like a river running down through its channel and it hits the sharp rocks and it divides into small, small, small streams and then comes back together. We can break, in a sense, we can break the character of God into its individual parts and we can discuss love and wrath, we can discuss purity and eternity, but we do understand that these are all fundamentally united. So God is never contradicted with himself, wrath versus love what he thinks versus what he does. We are. Because God is perfect in that way, then everything we see does reflect who he is. That brings us to a third point. With all humanity, Christian, Muslim, doesn't matter. What a religious person does reflects who they believe they belong to. Not perfectly because we are inconsistent, but as a general pattern, what you do in your ecclesiology reflects who you think you belong to. Not your official documents, but who you really think of when you think of the word God. I know that the town around you will probably never read your pastor's favorite books, but they already know his theology. They already know My theology in the little town of New Albany, Mississippi, it is being expressed every day in our ecclesiology in the biggest sense, in our church life. How we act is revealing who we think we belong to. What kind of a God do we belong to? Now, I say that grabbing the old books is not the starting place. Why? Because when these men wrote their books that deal with church life, That was the fruit of a labor. It wasn't the beginning of the labor. And you're jumping on at the end of the train line and you're benefiting from it. But unless you start where they started, you'll really not be what they're talking about. The starting place is God. A real transformation in our ecclesiology, not just our words starts with a slow, deep, radical, and I mean root level, not extreme, not not just wild, but deep, a deep transformation in what I think of God as I bring myself to the Scriptures day after day with the purpose of using the Bible to know God. So ecclesiology, in a sense, doesn't begin with the word, with the question, what? What does a church do? But it begins further back. Who or whom? Whom do we belong to? Now, I want to use these three men to illustrate. Moses, Paul, and Rehoboam. Let's take Moses. How does he illustrate the big principles I've just mentioned? If you read the book of Exodus and Leviticus, and Numbers in particular, you see God bringing his people out and preparing to bring them into the promised land, and you find over and over the activities of God so very clearly designed to instruct the people what kind of a God is he. You've spent 
centuries under Egyptian influence, you've got confused ideas of God. As soon as they're left alone, they build a golden calf and call it God. You think you can adjust God. You think I'm like Egypt's gods. I'm nothing like Egypt's gods. So let's begin the lessons. I'm going to meet with Moses on the mountain. No one else is allowed to come. No animal is allowed to come. If anyone touches the mountain, they're to be stoned. What an object lesson in holiness. If you want to come to me, you're going to have to come through the sacrificial system. Cut that animal's throat. Let its blood go into a bowl. Have the priest come and he sprinkles it. Once a year, he enters into the Holy of Holies. He goes to the mercy seat. It's covered in last year's blood. Again, he applies it again and again, year after year, to remind them. Now, as we look through these things, God dealing with the people, dealing with their sinfulness over and over, he's teaching them about himself, but really he begins by teaching Moses. Look at... Exodus chapter 3. Moses is now in exile. Why? Because Moses is a Jew and Moses cares about Jews. And Moses sees the problem of the Jewish condition. They are enslaved and it bothers him and he's not willing to be a person who keeps quiet and stays under Pharaoh's good graces. And so what does Moses do? He's radical. Because he responds radically. I mean, how much more radical can you get than to go out to the Egyptian and to say to him, don't hit this Jewish man, and then you get so angry, you hit him, he's dead, and you bury him. So he's a radical Jew. But he's not helped the people of God at all. So he's exiled. Then in verse 4 of chapter 3, we find the beginning of God making Moses the kind of man he can use. Moses has seen the bush and he says to himself, I'm going to go look at this bush. It's burning but not consumed. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. It's just Moses' first lesson. You've heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but now you're going to meet him and there are things you need to know. Now, in a very simple way, I just want to use this to illustrate. What kind of a man can be entrusted with the task of going back into Egypt and facing this world power and saying to them, in spite of this, this astonishing power that you have over these completely helpless people, I want you to let them go. And what kind of a man can do that and not quit? He has to be a man who's met God. So that when he goes, with all of his human inadequacies and doubts and fears, he doesn't quit the course, but he holds to it until the people of God are really are brought out. Now think about modern church life. When you are faced with a far greater tyrant than Pharaoh ever was, you witness to your children, you witness to your church members, you talk to your, your co-worker. When we see the needs around us and we understand that people are being held by the enemy in an Egyptian darkness, and it's worse than the Jews in Egypt because they love their darkness, and John says that when the light comes, mankind runs from the light, God must not only conquer our enemy and loot his house, he has to conquer us. And through regeneration, he makes us alive, free in our heart to love what's pure, in our mind to understand what's true, and in our will, the chains now removed we run to him. Now, when you think about how deeply enslaved a lost person is, even the nicest lost person, how do you look at that person and bring the gospel to them again without despairing? Well, you're going to have to be a person like Moses who has, in some measure, you have met the God that can save anybody. If all you have is a good book on evangelism, you just quit. I think that like Moses before he met the Lord, radically responding to the problems he sees, I think that the modern reform movement among American evangelicals is oftentimes very zealous, but starting our rethinking by looking at the problem instead of backing up and meeting God again, we look at the problem of the unevangelized cities and the wretched destructive quality of sin. And we say to ourselves, how can we help them? In a biblical metaphor, who will bring us into this great city? And if we start with looking at the problem of humanity, then we 
fashion our ecclesiology to save humanity, and we end up having a wrong ecclesiology that doesn't really help anyone everlastingly. So we don't want to start with the problem, but it's not just there. Look at the fragmented, destroyed American families in churches. We look at that. We say something's wrong with the family. Well, there is. So we fashion our ecclesiology by focusing on the family's problem. How am I going to fix family? Surely that's what the Lord wants us to focus on. And we become family-oriented churches, family-orbiting churches. You'll never help the family by focusing your church around the family. Our ecclesiology has to back up and begin with a sight of Him. Then we look at the city. We look at Him. We look at the family. Second example in Moses' life, Mount Sinai, in chapters 19 through 31, after they're out, you have 13 chapters of all this specificity. Moses, you're to do this and this and this, and you're to instruct the people to do this, and it goes on and on for 13 chapters, chapters 19 through 31. Moses has been on Mount Sinai in this cloud of glory for 40 days. It's a long time, and the people look around and say to themselves, I don't guess he's coming back. We need somebody to lead us. We need some God that we're comfortable with. And so they go to Aaron. You know the account. They fashion a golden calf. Now what I want us to see in chapter 32 of Exodus, verse 19 to 29, is I want you to contrast the response of Moses with the response of Aaron to the pressure of the people to fashion a God that's more comfortable for them. Verse 19, so it was as soon as he came near the camp, this is Moses, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot and he cast the tablets out of his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and he scattered it on the water and he made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you've brought them so great, that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that we, that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me and I cast it into the fire and this calf came out. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and he said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. It's quite a scene. If you don't think of it in felt board characters on a nice Thing. You know, you, this scene is not the one that you put on the felt board. What a contrast. Moses comes, sees, he's angry. His response is this. Everyone who is for Jehovah, tell me, that's us, all right? Get a sword. Kill everyone you can grab. Your friends, your coworkers, your family members. Kill them if they've been involved in this. The reason only 3,000 die is because the rest escape. Aaron's response is so very different. Make us a God. Oh, I'm not very comfortable with this, you know. Make us a God. Maybe we should ask Moses when he comes back. Make us a God. There's a lot of you out there, isn't there? Well, I'll make a God. And so he makes the golden calf. Let me ask you, did Aaron go to the wrong seminary? Did he go to a different seminary than Moses? Did he read a different ecclesiology book? Moses has seen something of the glory of God. And then he looks at sin, at the mess of church-ish activity. Aaron 
is viewing 100,000 Jews. It's all he can see. I don't care what your intentions are when you set off in the ministry, but you will surely be an Aaron if you do not set your face often first to see the invisible one. I was never tempted at age 23, pastoring, to, to lean toward any liberalism and mushyism. I preached every sermon from Ezekiel to prove how godly I was. But I feel at age 44, the temptation with people I like to make them the center of my pastoring instead of the uncreated God. And the only antidote I feel is to back up day by day and to see him. I know we laugh when, Andrew, when Aaron says that he threw the gold in and it came out of calf, but I... I hear it all the time, and I've done it. I don't see Reformed churches any better at this than Aaron. Who told you to put a rope from the top of the multiplex, multi-use room, I don't know what they're called, and uh, hang it down and put a rope dancer on there during the worship music? I've seen this on video of a new Reformed church plant Well, the girl, I mean, that's what she does. And she she wanted to use her talent for Jesus. And her mom asked me, and I felt it would be sad not to say yes. And I mean, how is it any different? I'm not worried about them. It's us that worries me. Third picture of Moses. After pleading with the Lord to be merciful and not to destroy the people and gaining again the presence of God with his people, he asked the Lord, can I see your glory? And you know the account. You cannot see my glory. You cannot look on that and live, but I will pass by you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. You'll see the after effects of my glory. And and he declares his nature. So Moses has that wonderful experience. Then in chapter 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39, more minutia. If you're reading through your Bible in the year, you're getting this about early, you know, February, late January, and you're starting to doubt your intentions. I want you to look at Exodus 39 with me. I'll just take one of the chapters, and I want you to notice a recurring phrase. Verse 1, of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry, for ministering to the holy place, in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. That's our phrase. Verse 5. And the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine woven linen as the Lord had commanded Moses, verse 7. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. As the Lord had commanded Moses, verse 21, they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod with the blue cord so it would not be above the, so that it would be above, sorry, the intricately woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. And that shows up again in verse 26 and 29, 31, 32, and then in verse 42. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Do you see the immensity of this task? All the minutia. Why? Because it's all reflecting God. What Moses leads the people to do will be an object lesson every day, year after year, preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah. What God does reflects his character. What Moses does reflects who he believes he belongs to. Who can be entrusted with so much minutia? A man who's been put in the cleft of the rock and God has passed by. Now, what about New Testament? Well, we don't have these rules, But our Lord is very precise. And he has very clear claims that he makes upon all humanity. And he has very clear commands for us as a church. How and what and why 
We do everything. But our precision, our precision ought to flow from an awareness that I have been put in the cleft of the rock, the cleft, I've been put in Christ, and the wrath of God has passed by, and all his attributes are now my friend. And I'm not destroyed because of Christ. So why would I want to be careless now with church? Why would I want to rethink it by looking at what man wants? I think that only the man who, only the man who is aware of the greatness of God is a man that can be trusted with that kind of detail. Now, before we look at Paul, I just want to give you one illustration of what I'm saying. We begin our ecclesiology not by asking what, but by asking who. George, uh, William Grimshaw, all right, not George Whitfield, George Whitfield's friend, William Grimshaw. William Grimshaw preached in the 18th century in the north of England, was powerfully used by God, was an unregenerate pastor for a long time, didn't know how to help people. When someone lost a baby and came to me and he said, look, you're gloomy because you're not out with happy company, go to parties. Another man was a drunk and his wife came to the pastor, Grimshaw, and said, my husband promised never to drink again. He drank again. What do I do with him? Grimshaw said, let me take care of it. The pub and the man's house were a long way apart and he had to go through the woods to get to his house. No street lights. This is 18th century. Grimshaw paints, you can read his journals, paints himself red, paints his clothes red, meets the man, the old drunk, in the middle of the night, stumbling back home through the woods, meets him in the woods and says, I am Satan, I've come to take your soul. You know you promised God, now you're mine. The man falls out, blubbers and cries and promises to be a good husband the rest of his life and Grimshaw lets him go home. That's radical and extreme, but really, folks, it's funny, but that's how you pastor when you don't know God. Then he, through a number of personal losses, hit bottom. And in the window, he saw a book somebody had left for him one time, John Owen on Justification. He read it, and he met Christ. Now, afterwards, Grimshaw was still quite a character, but we don't have time for those stories, all right? Grimshaw, what's so impressive about Grimshaw? Two things. One, Grimshaw is a Calvinist. John Wesley is so impressed with Grimshaw's spiritual abilities and effectiveness as a minister, as a traveling itinerant, as a pastor, as an organizer, he says, John and George always thought, they, John and Charles always thought they were dying. So John and Charles were always picking successors. If I die, you take it. No, I'll be dead before you. You take it. So they picked Grimshaw, a Calvinist, to take the Wesleyans. I don't think they understood how Calvinistic he was at that time. But that's how impressed John Wesley was with this man. Now, I'm not impressed with that. Here's, what I, here's my favorite story of all the Grimshaw stories, and there are a lot. People came from hundreds of miles to hear him preach. An elderly lady came. She came to hear him preach that week. She fell ill. She could not make it home. He, his wife had died. He has a maid and his children. He says to her, you can stay with me, this elderly lady. My maid will take care of you. So she writes in her journals in the 18th century what it was like to watch Grimshaw at home. So you have a window on this extraordinary minister. This is what she wrote about. She said, one time I was sick on a couch in the living room. He forgot I was there. He's walking through the room with his Bible in his hand. And as he walks through the room, he stops. He doesn't notice her. He weeps and weeps and weeps. He looks up and he goes on. Later, she asked him, uh, you didn't see me there, but I was watching you. What was it? He said, I was reading a passage about the beauty of Christ. I don't care to hear a, that a man has become reformed if he can't be like Grimshaw and be held captive by Christ. So first, Moses teaches us. We step back, we see him. Then we're ready to do ecclesiology. Lesson that we learn from Paul is that isn't just some nebulous, vague spirituality where we just fall in love with the Jesus of our imagination. But there is a very specific way. We look at who God is, we take his attributes that he's revealing, and we apply them to every aspect of church work and personal life. Why? 
Because everything that God does reflects him. So if we're doing evangelism well, we'll know we're doing it well because it's reflecting God. We'll know that discipleship is do, be, being done correctly because it's reflecting God. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us how to do evangelism on street corners versus how to do evangelism with your children versus... I mean, obviously, there are principles that we have to follow. So how do we know in the specifics we're on the right track? And that's where Paul can help us. Now, we only have time to look at one example That is Paul's use, Paul's application of the doctrine of God's omnipotence and how that changes the way he does pastoring. In Psalm 62, verse 11, the psalmist writes, power belongs to God. Not that he's powerful or all powerful or or more powerful, but he is all powerful. Power is the ability to do. Sovereignty is the right to do. We're talking about power. If you imagine, Pink said, if you can imagine a being that doesn't have the ability to do all that he desires to do, you have not imagined God. There is this all-powerful being, and it is essential to God's existence that he is all-powerful, not like us where we, we do things to exert power. God is essentially powerful. Just like you are essentially human, you didn't have to work on that. You can be a bad human or a good human. It's just what you are. God is all powerful. Now that affects the way Paul approaches Christianity. And it's just one example of an application. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23 through 25. When Paul talks about the gospel, Paul, what do you think about the gospel? Well, we know what he used to think about it. It's erroneous blasphemy, and anybody that teaches it ought to be killed. But now, how differently Paul views it. Look at verse 23 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul applies the attribute of God to the gospel. We ought to do this with every attribute, wisdom, patience, purity, everything. If you want to have an enlarged view of the gospel, you don't have to buy John Murray's book on redemption, accomplishment, applied, though I think that is a wonderful book. You could back up and you could look at one attribute and look at the gospel and another attribute and look at the gospel until the gospel that you view is a reflection of God. God is all-powerful. His gospel must be all-powerful. And so Paul says, I know the Jews reject it. I know the Greeks mock it. But I know the God behind it, all-powerful. The gospel is all-powerful. It is the power of God. But how he communicated that gospel was affected by his view of God's power. Chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Stop. Paul was a preacher a long time before he's a Christian. Do you think that Paul the teacher, Paul the Pharisee, Paul the great brain and rising star of Judaism ever went and gave lectures? I'm sure he did. Do you think he went like this? Oh, I didn't come with clever arguments. and I would think he would be exactly the opposite of this. But now he's met the God of all power. And so he says, I don't do that anymore. Verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Why not, Paul? They were in the demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith may not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Again, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, he talks about all that he goes through as a minister. And then he says this. We have this treasure in earthen vessels in order that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. You see how Paul's view of one attribute has affected how he approaches ministry. I go very plain, humble, and aware of my weakness, and yet bold, bolder ever than Moses was, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, because it is the all-powerful God that has sent me. Now, when he deals with false teachers in the church, he applies the attributes of God. Look at 2 Corinthians, sorry, 
1 Corinthians 4, verse 18. And this is where Paul just confuses us a bit. Verse 18. Now some of you are puffed up as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. Now he's dealing with some false teachers and men who are causing trouble in the church. So he says, I'm coming, the Lord wills. And when I get there, I'm going to find out what? Well, surely somebody mistranslated the Greek because he should have said, I'm going to find out what erroneous doctrine they're teaching. They are teaching erroneous doctrine. They are warping the church. They are, we find it as we read through 1 Corinthians. But he says this instead. I'm going to find out, not their words, but their power. And then he gives the reason in the next verse. Verse 21, uh, verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Do you see how that has been applied? God, the king, is all powerful. The kingdom is a thing of power. If a man walks with God, there is an, there is an enabling effectiveness. There is a power in his ministry. And the false teacher simply cannot have it. He can have bells and whistles. He can be impressive. Perhaps he could do his miracles. There are, there are satanic powers. But I'm talking about the real power to transform a life. Is his doctrine right? There ought to be power. Is his life right? Paul expects that anybody that is an honest ambassador of Jesus of Nazareth is going to have a certain degree of power. And so he says, I'll just test his power because he says he's in this kingdom and this is a kingdom of power, not words. One last example, Paul's view of the Christian life is affected by his awareness of this one attribute, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We know this passage, but know this, verse 1, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. And then he sums up their religion. They have a form of godliness, but deny its power. There is an effectiveness in the gospel to transform a man. And if you meet these people who are not trans being transformed into the image of Christ, they may have the form of Christianity, but they have resisted its power. They have resisted the reality and the effectiveness of the gospel. God is not at work in these people. And so don't take their profession of faith seriously. You're not even to hang around them. Now, I've just mentioned one attribute. Paul looks at God. Moses goes on the mountain. Paul wakes up. He searches the scripture. He ransacks it. Again, he is confronted with a God who possesses all power, unlike any other person we've ever met. And then Paul looks at the gospel. And Paul looks at the job of a minister. And Paul looks at the definition of a Christian. And it's all affected now. His ecclesiology starts with the question, who? And then the what flows. Let me give you the last, illustrate, last uh, life to illustrate. And that will be a shorter one. It is the life of Jeroboam. The kingdom is split. Jeroboam is the king of the south. Uh, sorry, Jeroboam is king of the north. Rehoboam is the real king. The Rehoboam is the king of the south. Jeroboam goes north. Jeroboam is God's hand-picked successor. He is promised the same mercies that David was promised. He is given an opportunity to be a man that walks with God and leaves, leads the northern ten tribes to walk with God, and he completely fails. He is a man-centered man. He is ignorant of the majesty of the God who has called him to this task. He drops the honor of God immediately, and under the pressure of humanity, he crafts a completely new, mere, parallel religion, one that's more convenient, one with an adaptable version of God, and one where anyone who wishes may lead. Now, the Bible tells us, and for the sake of time, I won't take you there. The Bible tells us that when he does this, all the Levites leave the north 
and go south because they're not going to be a part of this idolatrous worship. But not only that, everyone who fears the Lord sees the real preachers leaving, sees the golden calf being set up, and they pack their bags. They lose everything. They leave everything they own, and they go south because Rehoboam is still a king who worships God. Jeroboam has given us a golden calf. We're not staying here. It's a very costly thing, isn't it? To leave everything. Because where you are, they're going to, they've decided to worship an idol. Now, when they go down there, the Bible says that they strengthen the southern kingdom. And for a while, things look like they're going well. About three years. Now look at 2 Chronicles chapter 11. 2 Chronicles 11, we pick up with Rehoboam. Sorry, verse chapter 12. Yes, chapter 12, verse 11. Chapter 11, the people have moved south, verses 13 through 17. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom, this has been about three years, and had strengthened himself that he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel along with him. What a lost opportunity. He could have led them to walk with the Lord, but he didn't. Now, I want you to think about this. Which is the greater tragedy? Jeroboam invents a completely new religion, says, look, we've got our own thing going here. And he leads to the destruction of those tribes eventually. That's tragic. But Rehoboam says, it's okay, you can come here, you that love the Lord, because we're really serious about God down here. But as soon as he's comfortable, he drifts. And for the rest of his life, he's never a man that can be trusted. The Bible says that he was a wicked man because he never set his heart to seek the Lord. The people who move south, who lose everything and uproot their families and go south in the hopes that they'll be a part of a people who are centered around the reality of this great God, after a couple of years, look at each other and say, we were defrauded. We were lied to. This is just as idolatrous. It's just not as open. My question for myself is this. Am I, am I a Rehoboam? We live in the day of Jeroboam. That is clear. If you don't believe that, you're not reading your Bible and looking around you. American evangelicals have completely reinvented religion as a, as a stereotype and have shipped it to the four corners of the earth. And maybe we're not involved in that. So we say we're Rehoboam. We're the people like Rehoboam. We've got the real God and not that one. And we're not. But if people meet you, do they find out that you've got all this great new Bible-centered talk, God-centered talk. But underneath it all, you are as devoted to the old idol of self as any Jeroboam ever was. I pastor a small church, 200 We've been there 14 years. I hope the Lord lets me stay till I die. And I hope that's a long time, right? Long. New people come. Listen, the, the new reform movement. It's a window of opportunity. It was already said today. There are people discussing the doctrines of grace that didn't even know there were doctrines of grace. There are people attending doctrines of grace churches who would have once hated just the phrase doctrines of grace. This is a, a, really is a, an historic opportunity, a window. But it is closing like all windows close. And when they come to our reformed churches, it costs them. They have to leave family who think that they become cult members because now they're reading Puritans and John Calvin. They lose friends, they lose family, they lose churches, they uproot themselves. We don't think about that, we're just glad they show up at our church. They pay the cost, they come to our churches. But after they get over the, the wonder of doctrines of grace language, do they find that like Rehoboam, we aren't any more oriented to the God of the Bible than the church they came from. We just have reformed tongues. I am not broken hearted over the Arminian churches. I am broken hearted over the new Calvinistic churches. Because I look on their website 
and I'm thrilled. And if I pack my family up and move there, and I, meet the, and I walk in the church, I think I'm at the wrong church. It's not God-centered at all. If they didn't have a website, I wouldn't know they were centered around God. My fear as a pastor is that people will come and they'll notice the different things. We sing old hymns. We talk a little differently. We don't attack Calvinists there, so they, they feel safe. But after a couple years, they look at the people next to them and they say, I am as empty here as I was there. I just have a different set of words. I think it was Alistair McGrath's book, Big Brain from Britain. He wrote a book on a Protestant Reformation. He mentioned Luther and he said this, Luther wasn't the most intelligent guy and he wasn't the only guy thinking about the things he was thinking about. What sets Luther apart? Now this is really a very subjective thing for a scholar like Alistair McGrath to say. He said this, Luther was trustworthy. We have been given the most precious things. The doctrines have been restored. If we use them to go to the bar, if we use them to go to the radio or movie, and I'm not bashing you if you drink a beer, all right? But if that's what you bought with the gospel, then don't be surprised when people meet you and after a while they say to themselves, this is just as devoted to self as my old church. Why did we pay the cost? We don't have to, though, do we? Because we have God. So, like Moses, we meet him. And then we look at the human need. We meet him, and then we look at the church problem. And as we're being transformed, like the Apostle Paul, we apply the very specific descriptions of God to the very specific areas of church life. So why? So that in the church, by Jesus Christ, to every generation, he would receive that glory. Well, may the Lord help us.